be here this evening. Uh, we also welcome our online audience. And uh, tonight we're going to continue with our Bible study in uh, Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. So if you want to take your Bibles there. Uh, for those uh, visiting with us tonight on Wednesday nights, we do things a little differently than what we do on Sundays. Uh, we start off uh, with the Bible study, go about 30 or 40 minutes with that, uh, and then we'll break uh, for just a few minutes, and then we'll take up some prayer requests, and then uh, we'll break up into groups as far as ladies and gentlemen, and then uh, we will pray and then be done this evening. But uh, Genesis chapter 14, now, um, the last time we got together, uh, we started with verse 1, and uh, we made our way uh, all the way down to verse 12. And so uh, we left off verse 12 as far as uh, uh, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, and uh, their inhabitants were taken captive. And it says, uh, verse 12, And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt, dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. And so that's where we'll uh, pick up today. But uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day. And Lord, thank you for your blessings. And Lord, for the goodness and mercy you've shown to us, Lord. We're just grateful for all that you've done. Uh, Lord, thank you that we've got some visitors from our uh, sister church, True Vine Baptist Church, with us here tonight. Uh, we know that there are some others that are still on the way. And Lord, we just pray that you might give them traveling mercies uh, as they continue on their way. And Lord, we just pray that you'll bless our time tonight that we spend in your word. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth and, uh, Lord, to receive the understanding uh, and application that you would have us to receive. And, Lord, I pray that you'll bless our prayer uh, meeting that follows. And, Lord, we'll thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, verse uh, number 13, And there came one that had escaped, in other words, escaped uh, the capture of, uh, by these kings, and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. All right, so notice uh, here, uh, Abram the Hebrew. Abram the Hebrew. And so uh, uh, notice that the term Hebrew shows up for the first time here uh, in connection with Abram. And of course, uh, Abram is uh, the father uh, of the Jewish nation. Uh, take your Bible for a second and come over to uh, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, where it talks about the book of the generations of Jesus Christ. And uh, notice what it says here, Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, emphasizing the fact that Jesus is heir to the throne. And then it says, the son of Abraham, uh, connecting uh, Jesus Christ with being a Jew. So David shows his kingship, um, whereas Abraham shows the fact that he is of Jewish descent. And Jesus himself acknowledges this. Look over um, uh, at John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we have the encounter of Jesus with the woman at the well. And um, she alleges that he's a Jew, of which he does not deny. And then he himself endorses being a Jew. Um, look what it says here, uh, uh, 4.9, John 4.9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh the drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And then come on down, uh, same chapter. Um, look at verse uh, 22. In verse 22 it says, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So she alleges he's a Jew. He doesn't deny it. And then on top of that, he himself endorses being a Jew. Now, why is this important? Well, because there are those that will try to tell you that uh, the term Jew uh, is limited uh, to the two southern tribes of, uh, of Judah and Benjamin, and that the term Jew uh, is not appropriate um, as far as uh, the whole nation of Israel. Come on in, folks. You're fine. Come find a seat. We don't bite, and if we do, our shot records are up to date. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just going to pause for a second because I see some more coming in. Look what the cat drug in, man, I tell you. It's here too. We're, we're, we're going to have a full house tonight. All right, uh, I want everybody to know it's Acts 2.38. You must repent and be baptized. Oh. i got to behave myself. I'm sorry. Man, we're going to have a full auditorium tonight. Hey, Kevin, how you doing, brother? I'm doing all right. Uh, for those on camera, this is Pastor David Gibson coming in late. <laughs> 
I, 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 want, I want all the internet to know that Pastor Gibson was late tonight. <laughs> it's the thought that counts, amen? <laughs> Yep. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming. And so uh, it, it's a blessing to see this place fill up tonight. Amen. All right. So uh, we're in a Bible study and we're doing uh, Genesis chapter 14. And so uh, we pretty much, uh, you know, just got started here. And uh, we're in Genesis chapter 14, verse 13. And we're looking at this statement uh, as far as Abram the Hebrew. And uh, what I was saying is, as folks continued to come in, was sometimes people want to uh, limit the term Hebrew to those who are descendants of the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, uh, as though the term Jew or Hebrew uh, does not extend to all 12 tribes. And that's simply not the case. Now, no doubt the term Jew, the, the phonetics of it, Jew, Judea, and so uh, certainly uh, the term Jew uh, is uh, phonetically associated with the southern part of Israel, which is Judea. Uh, but nevertheless, a Jew is not simply one who is one of the two southern tribes, uh, uh, just like the term Hebrew, uh, but the term is associated with all 12 tribes. And so this is the first occurrence uh, of the word in the Bible here in verse 13. And so uh, as we talk about hermeneutics, which is uh, uh, the science of interpretation, uh, there's such a thing as, uh, as the law of first mention, the law of first mention. And basically, uh, uh, when, uh, what that means is the first time something shows up in the Bible that generally establishes uh, what its meaning is throughout the rest of the Bible. And so uh, when it says Abram the Hebrew, what that shows is this, is that the term Hebrew is associated with Abram, who is the father of all 12 tribes, not just the two southern tribes. And so I uh, just want to make sure that, uh, that we're clear on that. Now, uh, why was he called Abram, Abram the Hebrew? Anybody got a guess on that? Well, where did he dwell at? In Hebron. So he was called Abram the Hebrew because he dwelt in Hebron. And so uh, that region uh, later on is going to become synonymous uh, with the whole nation of Israel. Now notice at the end of the verse it says, and these were confederate with Abram. Um, what does the word confederate mean? In company. In company or in, in association, in fellowship. And so, uh, you know, historically, you know, you had the... Uh, the Confederate States of America. Well, what were the Confederate States? They were the association of those 13 southern states. And uh, what, what uh, differentiated uh, the Confederate States from the United States was this. The 13 colonies that were, uh, that were founded uh, in, in the American Revolution, uh, they were founded on the, on the precept that each state was its own independent autonomous state. And that the United States was a loose affiliation or association of the states together. And it was a voluntary association, and it was one that could be dissolved if a state decided to leave. Well, the, the Civil War forever destroyed that. And so I know that Abraham Lincoln is lauded in our history books as a hero, and you were probably taught that Abraham Lincoln is a hero. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was the greatest enemy of the Constitution of the United States this country ever had. Because, because Abraham Lincoln believed in, uh, in uh, a centralized government in Washington that ruled over the rest of the country. Whereas the founding fathers that got together uh, there and signed the Declaration of Independence and eventually implemented the Constitution, they believed that Virginia was its own independent separate state. North Carolina was its own independent separate state. And each of the 13 colonies that became states had a voluntary association. Well, Lincoln said, no, uh, you can't leave the Union. If you do, I'm going to kill you. And that's exactly what he did. What kind of president sends 85,000 soldiers to invade his own country? That's what Lincoln did. You know, what kind of uh, a president suspends habeas corpus, one of the core rights of our Constitution? Well, that's what Abraham Lincoln did. You know, uh, what did Lincoln do? Well, he had... Uh, you know, uh, in any newspaper that ran uh, uh, editorials or articles, you know, against him or his administration, he had them arrested and thrown in prison. And so uh, that's not someone who believes in freedom of speech and freedom of association and so forth. And so the Confederate states, they believed in what the founding fathers intended, a loose affiliation or association of the states that was voluntary, not at the point of a bayonet. Now, of course, everyone wants to make uh, the issue of the Civil War 
uh, slavery, that the Civil War was about slavery. The Civil War had nothing to do with slavery. Now, was there a controversy over slavery at that time? Yes, there was. Uh, was there disagreement between free states and slave states? Yes, there was. But here's the thing. The Civil War was fought over commerce and economics. Um, you know, the, the southern states provided uh, goods and services to the north, uh, and, and the north wanted to put a tariff on those. And the north said, you know, uh, take this tariff and you can keep your slaves. And the south said, no, we're not paying your tariffs. And so when the south, which had all the resources that the north needed, decided to secede, well, the north had no, uh, no choice but to invade. Well, when 600,000 American servicemen are dying and all that blood's being shed, you've got to have a justification for that. Just like George W. Bush had to make up weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist as a precursor for invading Iraq. So what do you do? Well, now all of a sudden, this war that started over commerce and economics, now it's about slavery. You say, well, you know, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln freed the slaves. Lincoln did no such thing. He signed an Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves of the southern states that were in rebellion. The Emancipation Proclamation didn't free slaves in the northern states. Ooh, dirty little secret. You didn't know there were slaves in the northern states? Yes, there was. Yes, there was. Yes, sir. Yeah, being the largest city in America, I wouldn't be surprised at that. And so, uh, you know, uh, you say, well, this is supposed to be a Bible study, not a history. Like, well, I know, but I, I'm just trying to help you understand what Bible words mean. And so when it says that they were confederate, what that means is there was a loose, voluntary association between Abram and these other folks, and either party could have exited that relationship anytime they wanted. And that's what the confederacy did, as far as the Civil War. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, if you want to call it right, it's not the Civil War, it's the War of Northern Aggression. That's right. And it's like one famous general said, never go north of the Mason-Dixon unless you're leading troops. <laughs> I can't remember, but it was a good one. I liked it. <laughs> All right. And so uh, uh, these were Confederate uh, with Abram. And so uh, and when Abram heard uh, that uh, his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Now notice in verse 14 it says, And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive. Go back up to verse 12. In verse 12 it says, And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son. So if it's your brother's son, what is that relationship to you? Nephew. That's your nephew, right? But notice uh, in verse 12, He's basically referred to as a nephew, Abram's brother's son. But notice in verse 14, he's called a brother. Contradiction? Not at all. It shows how familial relationships in the Bible are oftentimes interchangeable. And so, uh, you know, uh, over in, uh, in, in Daniel chapter 3, uh, you know, uh, Belshazzar, or Belteshazzar rather, uh, you know, uh, he's called, no, it is Belshazzar, because Daniel's Belteshazzar. Am I getting a, 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 a mixed up here? Uh, yeah, uh, 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 Belshazzar uh, is said to be uh, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. But he's not the son. He's the grandson. But the Bible uses the term son in much the same way uh, that uh, you know, a, a Saul says, Is not this the voice of David, my son? Well, David's not Saul's son. He's Saul's son-in-law. But the term is used uh, as far as son-in-law. You know, uh, people try to find contradictions uh, between the genealogies in Matthew and Luke because it says uh, that Joseph was the son of Jacob in Matthew, but it says that he was the son of Heli in Luke. Well, it's not a contradiction. Uh, in Matthew, he's uh, uh, the son hey, hey, uh, uh, of Jacob, but in Luke, he's the son-in-law of Heli, but the Bible calls him a son. Uh, sometimes Paul refers to David, as, uh, uh, excuse me, refers to Timothy as my own son after the common faith. Well, Paul wasn't Timothy's father uh, literally, but he certainly was his spiritual father. Yeah. So sometimes in the Bible, uh, uh, familial relationships can be interchangeable as far as their application. But notice the Bible will always define this for you because in verse 12 it's very clear that he's talking about a nephew, but when you read verse 14, 
His brother, the word brother here implies just a family connection as far as brother as in brethren. And so, uh, you know, no contradiction. And, you know, when someone tries to find a contradiction in the Bible, the contradiction is between their ears, not in the Bible. All right, so it says, uh, uh, verse 15, And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Haba, which is on the left hand of Damascus. Now, um, I don't, anybody got a, a, a Schofield Bible tonight? Uh, what, what, what's uh, at the top of the center column? There's usually like a date for ushers, or maybe it's in, you got that in Ruckman's uh, 1913. All right, so BC 1913. So this is about 2,000 years before the birth of Christ, which makes it about 6,000 years from now. And I want you to notice the military tactics, the advanced military tactics that are being used uh, in this passage. Uh, notice what it says. It says he divided himself against them. All right, so what, what do you think would be the advantage of taking your army of, uh, what does it say it was in verse uh, 14, uh, 318? So uh, that's going to be, what, uh, 159, I guess, if you split that in half, 318 divided by 2 is, uh, is 159. What would be the advantage of dividing into two companies of 159 versus attacking with all 318? You're going to flank them, but also, what is it going to give the appearance of regarding your force? It's going to make the size of your force look larger than what it really is. And so, uh, so this tactic of divide and conquer, so to speak, uh, what it does is you're going to have a flanking movement, but it also uh, is going to demonstrate uh, to the enemy that your force looks bigger than what it really is because you're attacking from two fronts. And then the second thing, uh, notice what it says. Uh, it says that they uh, 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 went after them by night and smote them. Well, in war, when do most battles take place? In the daytime. Yeah, um, m most conflicts take, take place in the uh, daytime, especially in ancient battles, you know, and even as recently as the Civil War, because back in the Civil War, do you think they had night vision goggles? No. How did Stonewall Jackson die? Friendly fire, because he was out where he wasn't supposed to be after dark, and his own men shot him because they thought he was the enemy. And so, uh, and that was only 150 or so years ago. And so, um, uh, back in these days, uh, conflicts were, were predominantly in the daytime because you had better visibility, right? And so, uh, but this is advanced tactics here. One, he's dividing into two separate companies. And two, he's attacking by night, which was not the common way of doing things back then. And so, and, and what's, uh, what's the end result? Uh, verse 15, And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them into Haba, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And so, uh, he's uh, chased them all the way back up towards Syria, because Damascus is in Syria. So, they're heading north. Uh, and he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods, and the women also, and the people. And so Abraham's campaign is successful, and he brings back all the people and all the goods. Now verse 17 says, And the king of Sodom, Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Ketileomer, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shady. Now, uh, uh, most of you weren't here the last time we got together. Uh, notice the Valley of Shady. Uh, we were talking about, uh, look back at verse uh, 3. You see in verse 3, you see the Vale of Siddim. Uh, and then uh, verse 8, you see the Veil of Siddim. And then uh, verse 10, and the Vale of Siddim. And so that word Veil shows up three times. And so just looking at the word Veil, if you didn't know any better, what is that word similar to? Valley. You don't even need a Greek lexicon, a Hebrew lexicon, or a Bible dictionary to figure that out, do you? And so a veil is a valley, and to make sure that you can't miss that, in verse 17, after using the word veil the first three times, here the Bible says, verse 17, the valley of Shavi. And so a veil is a valley. And so veil, of course, is an older English word. Uh, we don't really use it much anymore. Uh, but notice how the Bible, once again, defines itself. 
And so you'll get the critic of the Bible that will say, uh, well, man, that just shows why we need to get an NIV or an ESV or some other Bible uh, because nobody knows where the veil is. Well, if they make it down to verse 17, they will. <laughs> now, if you don't finish reading the chapter like you ought to, then maybe you'll be confused about what a veil is. Uh, I'll tell you this, uh, I bet they know what a veil is more than they know what a satrap is. Anybody know what a satrap is? Everybody's kind of like scratching like a what? <laughs> <laughs> Jock strap. <laughs> uh, take your Bibles and come to the book of Daniel for a moment. Yeah, don't worry. I say things like that all the time. And so, I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it's one of those things. Come to the book of Daniel and um, come to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. In uh, Daniel chapter 6, um, notice what it says here. Verse uh, 1, Daniel 6, 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. All right? Now, uh, according to the world, which would be easier to understand? The New King James Bible or the King James Bible? King James. No, New King James, according to, to the world. Oh, now, the world. Uh, to, to those of us that are Bible believers, of course, we would say the King James. But, but here's an example of why that's not true. Uh, notice the word where it says 20 princes. You know what the New King James says there? Satraps. What in the world's a satrap? Now, if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't know. Just admit it. You'd have to Google that thing or look at uh, look it up in a dictionary or whatever. You wouldn't know what a satrap is. Notice the King James Bible uses the word uh, that everyone understands, princes. Anyone here not know what the word princes means? Yeah, I didn't think so. Even someone that's not familiar with the Bible knows what the word princes means. So don't come at me with this clap trap about how we need to get rid of the King James Bible because it uses archaic speech that nobody understands. Not when you're using words like satrap. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, Genesis uh, 14. And so, uh, uh, the word veil is a valley. And uh, if you couldn't figure that out uh, uh, by the context itself, uh, then uh, that's why God gave you a good Bible dictionary. Amen? Or Webster's 1828. All right, look at verse uh, uh, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, boy, you talk about one of the strangest characters in the Bible. Uh, that's this fella, uh, Melchizedek. Who is he? I haven't got the foggiest idea. Other than what the Bible says about him here and what we're going to look at in the book of Hebrews. Uh, now, I can tell you a couple things. It says here he's the king of Salem. The king of Salem. What does the word Salem mean? Salem is a short uh, 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 version of Jerusalem, but what does the word Salem mean? Peace. 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 Comes from Shalom. Shalom. So, uh, so if he's the king of Salem, he's the king of what? Peace. All right. Now, Melchizedek, Melech, or Melech, that's the Hebrew word for king. So his very name means king, and then Zedek, Zedek, that's the Hebrew word for righteousness. So his name means king of righteousness, and this king of righteousness was literally the king of Salem. All right, so uh, what was accomplished at the first advent? Righteousness. What's going to be accomplished at the second advent when the millennium begins? Peace. So guess what? You'll never have peace without first having righteousness. You cannot have the crown before you have the cross. The cross brings forth righteousness, and the crown brings forth peace. And so uh, this fellow Melchizedek, his name means king of righteousness, and he is the king of Salem. So he is the king of righteousness, and the king of peace. And so uh, he's a, a, clearly a tremendous type of Christ. Um, as far as being a type of Christ, uh, he is a high priest. Well, in Hebrews, as we'll see here in a few moments, Jesus is called a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is connected with this fella, and so Jesus is a high priest after Melchizedek. Now look what it says. Um, let's see. Y'all help me. I, I, 
my vision is blurred up here. Uh, where, where does it say uh, about the bread and the wine? It says he brought bread. And, is it 18? Oh, it's, it's, it's the verse that, that I'm reading. Yeah. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. All right? Okay, what's, what's bread a picture of? The body of Christ. What's wine a picture of? The blood of Christ that was shed on our behalf on the cross. So we observe communion, and when we do, we have bread and wine. Now, of course, when I say wine, you understand I'm talking about the pure blood of the grape, what the Bible calls new wine. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, bread and wine. So he shows up offering the elements of the Lord's Supper. And uh, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, notice here, um, verse 18, the Most High God. Verse 19, the Most High God. Verse 20, the Most High God. And then verse 22, the Most High God. So, four times uh, this title, the Most High God, shows up. And I want to say to you tonight that this is not a Jewish title. This is a Gentile designation for God, not a Jewish one. Let's look at a couple of references. Take your Bible and come over to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. This Most High God title is a Gentile title, not a Jewish title. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, look at verse uh, 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. All right, Nebuchadnezzar, Jew or Gentile? Definitely Gentile. And so notice he's using a... Uh, Gentile designation for God, the Most High God. Uh, not only that, but look at Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. In uh, chapter 5, look at verse 21. And this is uh, uh, referring uh, to uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, but it's uh, the Queen Mother speaking. Verse uh, 21, And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses, they fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruleth in the kingdom of men, and whom that he appointeth over it, and that he appointeth over it, uh, whomsoever he will. All right, the Queen Mother, Nebuchadnezzar's wife, Jew or Gentile? Gentile. And so she's referring to God as the Most High God. Um, and then uh, come over to uh, um, Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, dealing with someone that's demon-possessed. Look at verse 7. 5, 7. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? And so notice that an unclean spirit there is referring to him as the Most High God. Uh, that's not all. Come to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Look at verse 17. Acts 16, 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Of course, this is this uh, demon-possessed young woman that, that uh, Paul cast the devil out of. And, uh, and then when her uh, uh, masters find out that the means of their income is gone, they end up having Paul and Silas arrested and thrown in jail. And so um, the, the last one I want to show you shows up in, in Hebrews, and I want to uh, come to Hebrews so we can talk a little more about Melchizedek. Uh, come over to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Now let's look at the last verse of uh, chapter 6, verse 19, or well, 19 and 20. Uh, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth in, uh, into that within the veil whither the forerunner, forerunner for us is entered. Uh, 6, uh, uh, 6, 19 and 20. Even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So uh, uh, the last verse in chapter 6 introduces us to Melchizedek. And then in 7, 1, it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, 
who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abram gave a tenth part of all, that being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. All right, so there it is. Without father, without mother. Well, now we're just, you know, we're off the rails now. We're just off the rails. Someone says, well, that was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Can't be. Jesus has a father and Jesus has a mother. God's his father and Mary's his mother. Can't be Jesus. And so without father or mother, what does he have beginning? Does he have end? I mean, come on now. <laughs> when you scholars out there, t t tell me, come on, Dr. Gibson, who, <laughs> who is this guy? <laughs> Yeah, some have theorized it's the Holy Ghost. You know, could could it be? Could be, could be. I I, I just don't know. Uh, all I know is this. Um, yeah, uh, some have theorized that it was a uh, even as you know the angel of the Lord is uh, uh, like a theophany or a Christophany as far as a pre-incarnate representation of Jesus Christ. That Melchizedek was a pre-incarnate uh, uh, representation of the Holy Spirit. Could that be possible? Absolutely. Can I dogmatically 1,000% say that's the case? No, I can't. And so we have to be careful to be black and white where the Bible's black and white. Uh, we need to be dogmatic where the Bible's dogmatic. But where the Bible's a little gray uh, and the Bible's not so black and white and it's not so dogmatic, we have to be a little careful and we have to show some grace. Now, if someone you know, uh, dogmatically says this, this is the Holy Spirit. And I'm, am I going to break fellowship with them and call them a heretic or anything like that? No, of course not. They want to believe that. That's fine. You know why? Because they might be right. But you know what? They can't prove that. That's right. Better be careful. Uh, stick with what you can prove. Salvation by the blood of Christ. Look, I can prove that. Deity of Christ. I can prove that. Salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. I can prove that. Uh, listen, as far as I'm concerned, pre-tribulation rapture, I can prove that. Pre-millennial, I can prove that. You know, and so there's things in the Bible that we can prove. Uh, the virgin birth, we can prove that. And so, uh, but the things we can prove, we should prove. The things that we can't prove, we better be a little careful about how dogmatic we get. And sometimes the brethren get dogmatic about things that can't be dogmatic. I'll give you a prime example. I'm going to make some of you mad with this. It's not the gap fact. It's the gap theory. Now, I subscribe to the gap theory, but I don't care. Uh, D Demopolis can write all the books he wants to write. You know, uh, you know, Brother Chad Reese gets mad at me when I say this sometimes. Uh, you know, but it, it just is what it is. It's the gap theory, not the gap fact. Now, is there evidence that points towards the gap theory? Absolutely. But you know what? There is evidence that points against it. And sometimes the brethren, especially from the Ruckmanite persuasion, they don't want to look at all the evidence. And so, uh, now I believe there's more evidence to support the gap theory than there is that goes against it. Therefore, I believe in the gap theory and I teach the gap theory as a matter of doctrine. But I'm not mad at somebody who doesn't believe it. And there's a lot of good brethren who don't believe it. And, and, and that's fine. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, be dogmatic where the Bible is dogmatic and you better show some grace uh, in, in some of these other areas. Verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, without descent, so uh, 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 no genealogy no comes after him. Uh, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, of all the theories I've heard, some kind of connection with the Holy Spirit makes the most sense in the absence of any other facts that would go against that. And so, if you want to connect Melchizedek with the Holy Spirit, uh, you and I can still be friends. Now, watch verse 4. Now, consider how great this man was unto who even Ab or the patriarch Abram gave the tenth of what? The spoils. So, go back up. It says, uh, verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Of all what? The spoils. All right, now why do, you say, uh, why do you emphasize that, brother? Well, here's why. Um, there are those that will take Abraham tithing to Melchizedek as uh, an illustration of since this occurs before the law of Moses, it shows tithing under grace before the law. Therefore, tithing is applicable under grace after the law. And that's not the case at all. 
because Abraham didn't tithe off of his income. What did he tithe off of? The spoils of war. He went to war with these kings, recaptured everything that had been stolen, brought the women and kids back and all this, and what did he give to Melchizedek? Not a tenth of everything he had, a tenth of the spoils that he recovered. Uh, another verse folks will use is over in uh, Genesis 28. Look at Genesis 28. This is uh, Jacob's ladder. Look at verse 20, 28, 20. And we're just about out of time here. We want to take a break and, and uh, have our prayer meeting. But in verse 20 it says, And Jacob uh, uh, vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, of all, not just spoils, but of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto, me, unto thee. All right? I'll give you a nice crisp, crisp Benjamin if you can show me a verse in either testament where Jacob ever did that. Did Jacob make a vow that he was going to do that? Yes, he did. Is there any evidence that he ever did it? Not one. Not one. So those are the two primary verses that, that people will use to justify tithing as being relevant for the New Testament uh, church. But where do we get our doctrine from? The Apostle Paul. Does the Apostle Paul in even one of his epistles ever mention the word tithing? Not once. In the New Testament, where does the word tithing occur? Matthew. Hebrews. Matthew, what's its theme? King of the Jews. Hebrews, who's that written to? The Jews. And so tithing was an Old Testament commandment given to sustain who? The priesthood. Because Levi had no inheritance in Israel. So how did Levi serve God and still survive if he couldn't farm land and couldn't uh, uh, sell goods because he was taking care of the tabernacle, the temple. How did Levi survive? The tithes of the other tribes. So the purpose of the tithe was to sustain the priesthood. Guess what, brethren? Does not Peter tell us that we are all part of a royal priesthood as far as the New Testament? And so uh, the tithe was Old Testament under the law and although you find illustrations of it before the law in the lives of Abraham and Jacob, that still has no New Testament application for the church because Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, never mentions it one time. So does that mean you're supposed to be a cheapskate for God? No, you're not. Let me ask you a question. Who should do better? A servant giving by commandment or a son giving out of love. People say, uh, it, it, if you're not tithing, uh, you're robbing God. Right. That's what I, was taught in the I say if all you're doing is tithing, you're robbing God. <laughs> if, all you're do if all you're doing is tithing, you're robbing God. Because look, a servant by commandment, knowing he would be judged if he didn't do it. If he could do 10%, we can't do better than that under the New Testament? The Bible says this, that let a man give as he purposes in his heart. How? Cheerfully. Why? Because God loveth a cheerful giver. You know, people say, give till it hurts. <laughs> no, give till it feels good. You know, I, I believe there are seasons in life where we are not necessarily able to do everything we would like to do. And I think that God understands that, and I don't think that we have to walk around with guilty conscience. Brother Gibson's like, be quiet, be quiet. I don't want Truvon to hear this part. No, this kid. Joking. But you know what? God understands that we go through seasons. You know, all of a sudden your your transmission, you know, blows on your car, your 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 uh, your uh, dog gets ran over and you got a vet bill. Yeah, your your your, your mother-in-law moves in and you need psychiatric uh, treatment. You know, <laughs> Byron, don't you shake your head. Miss Wanda's watching you, brother. <laughs> yeah, and, and so there are seasons, but you know what? 
That just means that when we have seasons of abundance, then then we can make up for all those times where maybe th times were a little lean. You know, it, it's been a rough year, but then you get your tax return. If you get a tax return. When I have little kids, I got tax returns. Now I've got tax bills. <laughs> I want to go back to the good old days when the kids were little and I got, uh, what do they call that thing? The, uh, 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 the earned... The earned income tax credit. Yeah, I want to go back to those days where Uncle Sam was giving me money instead of me giving him money. Uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, you know, um, you know, you get your tax return and you got a little extra money. Well, you know, maybe six months ago, you weren't able to tithe because it was a rough time for you. Now you got a little bit extra. Well, maybe now you can make that up to the Lord a little bit, you know. And so uh, God understands all that. And so I, I don't preach this legalistic stuff where, you know, uh, bless God, if you don't tithe, God's going to blow up your transmission, kill your dog, make your mother-in-law move in, and, you know, and, and until you get right with God and quit robbing God, you know. And so uh, I've heard these fundamentalists, man, I tell you what, man, some of the things that they preach is just such utter nonsense, but nevertheless. All right, coming back to Genesis, let's wrap it up here. Um, let's see, uh, verse 20, and he blessed the Most High God, which uh, delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And so tithes of all there, of course, is tithes of the spoils, according to Hebrews 7. And the king of Sodom uh, uh, said unto Abram, Give me uh, the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take uh, from the, uh, a thread even to a shoe lash it, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men uh, which went with me, uh, Anir, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Let me ask you a question, you know, right here as we close. Why, why do you think uh, uh, Abram uh, uh, wouldn't take anything from this king when this king's offering him this reward? I mean, had not Abram earned it? Sure he had. He, re he rescued this king. He rescued this king's family. He rescued this king's kingdom. I mean, Abram certainly had earned the right to receive something from him. I think it goes back to chapter 13, verse 13. Because in 13.13 it says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. I don't think that old Abram wanted anything to do with the Sodomites. He didn't want anything to do with the Sodomites. And watch this. What was Lot's problem? Lot's problem was he'd already pitched his tent towards Sodom. And he ended up in Sodom. And when Sodom got taken captive, he got taken captive with him. You know what the solution to that is? Stay out of Sodom. Don't associate with Sodom. And so I, I think that that's uh, in addition to uh, Abram uh, not wanting to, uh, someone to say that the king of Sodom had made him rich. He didn't want anything to do with those men that were sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Uh, I got news for you. You know what, Christian? You ought not to have nothing to do with them either. That's right. right. All this pride garbage. Did y'all uh, preach this uh, this Saturday, brother, uh, at, at the pride thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's what Byron was telling me. I was it as vile as it usually is? Sure enough. I had uh, eight soldiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I took eight out there with me. Last year, I uh, only went four of us, and they put stickers all over me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What, rainbow stickers? Rainbow, uh, yeah, the heart rainbow stickers, you know, all on my pole, all on my sign, all on my face. You came out of there with love. All that love, brother. <laughs> the woman that preached, they took the head of war and she was. Oh, like, yes. She nailed them good. <laughs> and then, yeah, she spoke a little bit of tongues, but that. Well, let it go, man. That woman, that woman draw the cat crowd, man. Amen. We were standing in Perman. <laughs> that woman got the. Nobody should off. No doubt. Well, you know, uh, no, 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 you're fine. I, I, I brought it up. But, uh, yeah, I, I think Abram here just uh, doesn't want to be associated uh, with these, uh, these sodomites. All right, so. Um, amen. So that uh, finishes. Yeah, uh, there's no copyright on the truth there, brother. Amen. I'm sure I've stolen a few things from you here and there, too. <laughs> verse 1 on the next chapter, as far as. Um, Abram being content after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, If you're not Abram, I am, I am not shield, and I have seen great reward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Amen.
So we'll take a break right there with uh, verse 24, and uh, we'll pick up uh, fresh with verse uh, 1 of chapter 15 the next time we get together. And so uh, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, for those that are watching online, uh, we're going to uh, go ahead and end the broadcast and start our prayer meeting. Uh, our prayer meeting is exclusively for those that are here in person. And so uh, we invite you to come out and join us sometime.